you, Kunal. Uh, and thank you, Professor Egluert. This was wonderful. Uh, a lot of things, you know, that came to me for the first time. And since I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a person who has been working in this field, your work has been phenomenal. I've been following it for quite some time now. Uh, I have, I'll start with a personal question. Like you are one of the preeminent experts of carbon geo storage. And uh, could you provide some insights that what are the current challenges associated with carbon geo storage and some future industry trends? Because a lot of our audience, you know, they are researchers working in the same area. And if they could get some words of wisdom from you that these are some of the things that you need to explore to make it you know, more industry ready, that would really be great. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I believe it can the technology CCS works, I would say. Of course, there are some open scientific questions there always are. But as far as I see it, it's mostly a political question because it costs money. But I have seen it costs about one third more the energy if you add the CCS. And um, yeah, the government probably has to introduce some tax, otherwise nobody cares. Uh, so the, I believe that's the biggest challenge, it's more in the political arena. Um, and so, okay, from scientists, what can we do? Uh, I mean, of course, there are always more things to study. Uh, interesting is, uh, and we are doing this a bit as well, is the CO2 mineralization. I'm sure you have heard about the CarbFix project in Iceland, where they even have even a science paper, <laughs> which is in our area, not common, can tell you. Um, and they injected, I think it was it carbonated water. I think it was a single phase. It's um, already somewhat questionable, you know, because of economics. Okay, that's just a test pilot product. So they inject, they dissolve CO2 at high pressure. It's already an acid. It injected into basalt, which is volcanic rock in Iceland. They have the volcanoes. volcanoes. Um, and uh, um, okay, they, they said uh, in this paper, after two or three years, the CO2 has mineralized. It has been integrated into the rock somehow. And how? Okay, if that works, amazing. Um, but uh, I would uh, like to know more details. How exactly does it work? And I'm sure this is being explored. Um, but but I think this is not very well understood. This could maybe even solve the problem uh, with the CO2. Plus, um, what I've just shown you, and we do this with bacteria, um, that hasn't been tested at all, I would say. For CO2, maybe not that important, but it can make a difference. I mean, we will do that. But of course, it's also new to work with bacteria. It's, you, know, you need to, new equipment and you need to learn more things. But it's actually not bad to learn more things. Um, so just generally, the whole, whole um, oil and gas industry formerly, um, bacteria are not very well understood or studied. So even for oil production, this is new. Um, that's something we will also do more. Um, plus, just generally, on the, let's say, very small level, quantum mechanics, um, I would be interested also in collaborating more some of the very fundamental questions. Say, for example, which type of zeta potential you have um, in the subsurface at true CCS conditions. And uh, because you have chemical reactions with acid and so on. This would be useful information, I think. And it's new. Um, also, but we, this is not uh, of interest, would be also we do this, um, use chemicals to improve storage capacity. So we have, for example, we, I call it primed, the reservoir, sandstone reservoir in this case, with um, different chemicals. And then we can improve, let's say, the wettability or the adsorption capacity or something like that. I think there's some potential as well. It's a bit like chemical EOR, but now we call it chemical CCS. No? It's for the same reservoir, same thing. Um, and this, of course, this is a given in, you know, exploring it and so on costs billions, actually. It's very expensive. So um, a bit of chemicals may be not that expensive, but it's hard, always hard to convince the engineers. Um, but, but ultimately, I would say 
Um, okay, but it keeps coming back in Australia, it depends very much on the government. Some, sometimes they like it, sometimes they hate the CO2, and the funding comes with it. Um, and um, but there's funding keeps coming back because you know the CO2 doesn't go away because the government decides it's not there anymore. It's not like that. Um, and uh, but here in Australia, we, the funding uh, has shifted a bit more towards hydrogen. And hydrogen is new. For us, it's very easy to do hydrogen research. I mean, pretty much anything we do, we can easily publish. Um, the, the hurdle there is, um, you know, the, in, in Australia, we have lots of this health and safety paperwork. Um, and if, yeah, it's too much, actually. But, um, you know, uh, well, we have uh, dealt with a lot of this. And, you know, but it can be done. I mean, uh, so, so for funding, hydrogen is better, at least over here. But CCS, it's, it's not that, I would say. Depends where you are. For industry, probably CO2, CCS is more important, I would say. Because that's a direct solution to their problem. Thank, thank you so much for that insight. And especially we here in India also, we have a huge reserve of basalts that can be utilized for long-term carbon fixation by injecting CO2 carbonated water as a single phase. So rest assured, efforts are ongoing in that field. Just uh, a thought from you. Uh, do you think, uh, are there any challenges transitioning towards a hydrogen-based economy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, definitely. I mean, one of the one is the production side. I have been in Europe a few months ago, and it's very clear they want green energy um, and also green hydrogen. Sounds good. Um, but where does it come from? Where has all the hydrogen coming from? One of the, okay, one of the new things is also um, natural Hydrogen. I should maybe tell you the color palette of hydrogen. So there's black hydrogen, which is produced out of steam reforming, out of methane, you get CO2. So it's, it's just meant, that's called black hydrogen. Then we have blue hydrogen. It's a here around the corner, Woodside is an uh, oil company. They uh, propose to produce blue hydrogen, which is st again steam reforming, CO2 as a byproduct, but, but then uh, CCS. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or well, green hydrogen, but the problem, this is the best in a way, but you have to make it out of solar energy or wind energy. And that's very expensive is the problem. But only that is kind of green. Uh, or in France, they have the um, yellow hydrogen, which is interesting. That's the um, hydrogen uh, generated by nuclear power, um, which they managed to classify it as green in the EU. I'm not sure how they did that because I'm a skeptic. And I'm wondering how can it suddenly nuclear uh, green? But anyway, and uh, there's a gold hydrogen, and gold hydrogen is just, it turns out, suddenly all the geologists are uh, just um, buzzing around and they talk all about natural hydrogen. And this, you can just pump it out of the um, surface in Mali, in Africa, they have a reservoir, I think in Brazil, and even here around the corner, we have a project. We now found some natural hydrogen. And then the question is, how big is it? Can it be recovered? And I heard some geophysicist, he told me, you know, two or three months ago, uh, even the iron core of the earth is uh, not just iron and nickel or something like this, but this has hyd hydride in it. Okay. Okay, I'm sure he knows what he's talking about. So suddenly hydrogen everywhere. But uh, so, now, yeah, I mean, this, I don't know. I mean, but there's potential, so we explore this gold hydrogen. That would be a good solution. Um, and it would be very cheap, of course, hard to say. Green hydrogen is also a political uh, you know, decision. It's much more expensive. But also nowadays, I'm sure you have, you know, the energy security is just another thing. This, it says Russia doesn't supply gas. And but let's say your solar panel is still there, so there's yes, this is not an easy answer somehow. So, and you have a decentralized system and greener, etc. Um, you know, a lot of factors come together. 
but it's a bit, I mean, hydrogen definitely has more potential, even in chemical industry. I'm sure it will grow, but as I will ultimately, and I think probably from what I've heard, it, it will have some niche or maybe bigger um, applications, like in an airplane. But I understood some experts told me the bigger the vehicle is, let's say an airplane or uh, a ship needs hydrogen, cannot work with uh, electricity. So there are some or buses. There's definitely some application for hydrogen. Um, plus, you can store it in a large quantity, which has shown. It's, it's, it's also we think what I've heard is the inner, um, idea as a battery. Let's say you have too much electricity, or I don't know, so too much sunshine. We have this here quite a bit. Um, and then, how do you store the uh, um, excess electricity? So, for example, in Perth, I'm here in Perth in Western Australia. They, what I heard, um, they just um, pay the stadium to keep the lights on overnight because of this oh. excess electricity mm -hmm. or over day, maybe over day, probably not overnight. I don't know. But there's too much. So they just do something nonsensical. So uh, even if the efficiency is low, I think it's only 20%. It's better to have 20% hydrogen than nothing when you can store it up. But essentially, hydrogen as a battery is, is another, let's say, yeah, option for hydrogen. So it's I can see that it has more potential, but um, the question probably more for an economist. It's very hard to predict what will happen. You know? uh Thank you so much for bringing that to the table. And since you already mentioned that there is a possibility of producing white hydrogen, uh, don't you think that a lot of the skills that the petroleum engineers have, including uh, exploration, drilling, recovery of you know all those hydrocarbon in like liquid and gas form, don't you think that those skills are transferable to the new hydrogen-based economy that's going to come up? Yes. Oh, well, yeah, definitely. And anything which is related to geo storage, for sure, yes. Um, also, let's say, okay, and that is quite big. Um, well, it is already being done, and it will be done more. And for CCS, 100% sure, and hydrogen storage, okay, there's still some, let's say, competit or competitors in the race, I would say. I mean, liquid hydrogen, I don't know. I mean, okay, everything has its function somehow. Um, depends. Um, you need probably everything somehow mm. but so yeah i mean petroleum engineers um this is a good area for them i would say so but but um you know i don't know how is it in india but um here not many we, do, we have a lack of students um not many people want to do petroleum engineering at a, but it doesn't mean that the gas industry so suddenly disappears. It doesn't actually. Um, so it's even now, uh, if you start now, it's, I mean, it's very hard to predict what will happen in 20, 30 years. But, but um, at least now there's, there's virtually no competition for you in the job market. So, you know, and oil, and even, even if uh, the whole um, energy, supply route is changed, like yeah, exchanged with hydrogen or so on, you know, clean fuel, oil is still being produced and used for the you know the chemical industry. And so but but yeah I mean anything with geology and storing the subsurface petroleum engineers are very good at that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that insight. And now let's come back to like hydrogen geo storage. I can see a lot of comments on petrophysical and pet, uh, physiochemical properties that influence hydrogen geo storage. So mm -hmm. if you could like provide a couple, if you could just let us know what are some of, you know, the most important physiochemical properties that influence hydrogen storage, that would really be useful to the audience. Yeah, okay. So um, the main storage mechanism for the uh, Hydrogen in a normal reservoir would be, um, let's say, in one of the newer reservoirs would be the, um, the caprock integrity in a well. And with that, 
associated with that is this rentability, whether it flows through or not. Um, and that's a bit complex, but it's definitely one of the key parameters. I mean, densities are well known, but that's kind of kind of understood. Um, yeah, so I would say that's one of the key things. Um, what is um, not strictly physical chemical, I would say, is the influence of bacteria, especially on the chemical reactions. How much, let's say, had a, to phrase it in a quick question, this would be how much hydrogen is lost to these bacteria. Um, but that's more like a biochemical question, I would say. That's quite important. Also, from a reservoir engineering point of view, let's say you would have to consider what we call mesoscale parameters, relative permeability um, or capillary pressures. But this is then again related to these physical chemical parameters. Mostly. Plus the, um, but that's a purely geological question. Let's say the um, pore network of the rocks. Um, there, I mean, the um, models are advancing, but um, let's say the, let's say good models, what I would uh, consider, a re, um, let's say, a sufficiently good prediction for real re engineering applications needs a supercomputer to um, predict these relative permeabilities and so on. Like, we need to really um, get to the bottom of this. And that's, you know, that's something not everybody can quickly do. You know, deal with a supercomputer, have even access and all of this. It's different somehow. Um, yeah, but it's of interest. Um, and then what I also think is quite important, but it's also related to these contact angles, let's say, um, related to that, what is the surface chemistry precisely in the subsurface at real conditions? Let's say, uh, does it chemically react, for example? Or, I mean, for example, organic should possibly react with hydrogen. Um, or even carbonate, does it now react or not? And some minerals do react, etc. cetera. Um, and then if you add water, does it change? You know, the chemical potential is somehow different. And if you add different types of salt, does it change? And then you add to your, let's say you are evil, you add bacteria, and it gets very complicated. And, and bacteria can also affect these physical chemical parameters. That's what we also study. Um, but uh, otherwise, from a mechanical, okay, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a vague term, physical chemical. Mechanical would also be important um, for salt. But, uh, does it now, you know, with hydrogen storage, uh, does it get more brittle or not? Or even in a sandstone, you know, does it change the geomechanical behavior? Is there some overlap with that as well? Uh, so, Professor, one more thing. Like, a lot of the questions, they have come around hydrogen recovery once you have stored it. And that is where I somewhere imagine the role of cushion gas to be important. And uh, so the question would be like, what is the role of cushion gas in hydrogen recovery process? And what percentage of hydrogen is generally left behind in the reservoir once it is stored and then it is recovered and then it is again stored? So in the cyclic process of uh, production and storage. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, it's a, it's a devil or bills group, I would say. So I mean, let's say you have two options. Either you use the cushion gas or you don't. I mean, if you don't, um, you you um, have a purer hydrogen, and also you probably lose a bit of purity if you recover it. You can just pump it out again. It is you prob probably you. If you're lucky, you don't have to refine it again. Um, but the problem is the reservoir engineering. When you, you want to pressurize your reservoir to store more, let's say more hydrogen, or to withdraw it again more easily. And you possibly have to maintain for reservoir engineering reasons. You may, may have to, but it's, it's a geomechanical reasons, you may have to retain certain minimum pressures, etc. And uh, but from engineering point of view, you have some requirements. Um, and if you have, okay, so you either add more hydrogen, but as you have just seen, the compressibility is very high. That's a bit hard. Or you add, let's say, CO2, another gas, um, nitrogen, let's say, um, the problem is, um, okay, you have, you can easily increase your pressure then, the CO2, but 
but um, you have a, a more, very lower um, purity of your hydrogen and then you um, although maybe for some applications you might even get to that but I think they're still researching I mean and imagine that in a fuel cell area they look into let's say less pure hydrogen which can be burned etc I don't know what's the limit maybe I think I've seen 70 percent even nowadays I'm not sure but that would be a good area it's not my area at all there are fuel cells which can operate this low um, low purity hydrogen I think that would be pretty good um, but I think we can if we it depends on the reservoir engineering requirements um yeah, I mean probably if you have uh 50 50 percent gas you have to refine it that's just expensive um yeah so it's 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 not fantastic actually that's that's the drawback I guess um if you have to refine it would be more expensive the plus point is okay you have a very large quantity um so yeah yeah that's okay nothing is perfect I guess so, Professor, we spoke about chemical UR, then, you know, transitioning to chemical CCUS. And uh, don't you think there is a possibility of having chemical hydrogen storage, storing hydrogen in form, injecting hydrogen in form of uh, foam or, uh, you know, using certain surfactants to modify or alter the wettability to make the rock more conducive to hydrogen storage? Any insights around that? Yes, um, we have actually done this a bit exactly. What you just proposed, we have. I think we have done it. Actually, um, we should have one or two or three papers, maybe, but in a very simplistic way. For now, we just take, let's say, calcite crystal, just a single crystal. You can just buy it in some shop, and we purify the surface. Um, as you can imagine, as chemists, you know that the surface uh, has to be prepared well. Otherwise, it's all over the place. It's an important thing, actually. Um, and then you can add, let's say, you can dope it with different chemicals. Um, and yes, you can increase the, let's say, hydrophilicity, which would indeed um, increase storage, structural storage capacity. Okay, there are some operational questions, of course. How do you inject this chemical into the reservoir to spread like that? But there are still a lot of questions, actually. Um, from reservoir modeling to let's say dispersion studies, et cetera, Re reactive transport and so on. I mean, this is not simple. Um, and yeah, so I'm sure somebody can show mercy into some of the modeling there. Um, so, okay, we mostly do of course what we are specialized in. Um, and we can see the one of the main trajectories I'm focusing on now is the bacteria. Um, because I can really see, I see a big lack of um, understanding. Um, plus that's a real benefit as a chemist. I can understand, let's say, I mean, life science is not my main area actually, but I can much easier understand the chemistry and you know biochemistry than an engineer. That's a real advantage of a chemist. They're pretty flexible. Um, but, but of course, we still collaborate with some biologists to know what they're talking about. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That has been very helpful. Uh, similar to carbon mineralization uh, that takes place in rocks over a period of time, uh, is there any instance of hydrogen mineralization taking place? Yeah. Um, yes, to some extent, yes. I mean, I call it mineralization. But uh, out of my head, there are some papers, for some of the early ones in... Uh, came out of France, I think, University of Olio. They tested the seven, eight, ten different minerals and how they react with or without water, with hydrogen under reservoir conditions, but it is just a batch reaction. Um, and now I think iron, like pyrite, iron sulfide, and disulfide reacted. And it's looked like, um, I have to check the study again, but some minerals reacted. I think the iron which can be somehow reduced, I guess. Um, the, I mean, I wouldn't call it mineralized, but it has changed the rock. And so the solid phase changed. And organic, I believe, can be changed. I, I think there has been some analysis in that respect. So that would change. That would be quite important then again for these 
uh, physical chemical reservoir parameters actually. Um, and I mean, uh, carbonate, I imagine it can also react somehow, but I haven't seen a study for that. I mean, this is something we also try to do, but we were uh, we still um, are building a reactor and you know the safety aspect with hydrogen, etc. Um, it hasn't been done yet. But uh, plus, plus, I think you probably have to go. Although I totally agree that it should be done step by step. Let's say you do um, just qu let's say quartz or I py pyrite or something like this. But at some point you have to add water, then you have to add salt, and then you know you have to add the bacteria or the organic matter as well. It gets really complex. Um, but but only then you have the whole system somehow. And now yeah, the, the redox potential. I mean, this is okay, that's maybe one of the key differences between hydrogen and CO2. Um, CO2 can be acid, yes, but hydrogen has a like um, very different redox behavior, I would say. Um, so it's, in that sense, it's quite different, actually. Um, but but I don't, um, to, to cut it short, I don't think you can just simply mineralize it, I would say. Probably it reacts into some, well, yeah, it could, I don't know. I mean, if it's, if it, it can be integrated into organic matter, I believe, that can just, um, Oh, that reminds me, Actually, I have forgotten to mention the orange um, hydrogen where you um, have some rocks, I think serpentinization or something like this, the geologists can pronounce it. Um, and this is some also, okay, I'm, I'm not sure it's a special rock, but not that special, it sounds like it's really common. And it um, can you add CO2 and you get hydrogen out of it. It's the orange hydrogen, it's like too good to be true. Um, and but okay, maybe it can be mineralized, but it's less likely than CO two. I think if this is a very low risk, I believe, then it's I believe way higher risk would be that the bacteria eat the hydrogen. They convert something into something else. So the jury is still out. This is a potential area of research for all the people you know who are interested in this field. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, actually, there are a lot more questions, but we are running short of time. So I have just one final question. Would you like to provide any words of wisdom to people you know who are sitting in this conversation and anything you would like to share? Any thoughts, any comments, or would you like to invite them? Whatever works for you. Yeah, I mean, it was a pleasure to participate and we can make another session and answer more questions. Um, no problem. And I hope it was of interest to you. And of course, let me know if you're in Perth, Australia, let me know. And I can show you uh, face to face what we are doing. It would be a pleasure. And I try to come to India, hopefully next year, um, and visit you guys as well. And yeah, I mean, if, if any one of you is a microbiologist or expert in quantum mechanics, um, we, there, are, uh, there are a whole package of things to do, actually. I would be very interested um, in collaborating. Otherwise, generally, um, I would say if to the um, chemists, uh, let's say the fresh freshman chemists among you, overall, I mean, you have to do, of course, what you like to do. That's probably advice number one. Um, that's really important. But generally, geology, you know, when I, I'm, not, I'm coming out of chemistry, you know, I, I didn't know a lot about geology. I'm still surprised how much money is in rocks. That's really quite amazing. And you have a you have a broad area from oil and gas to now you have just heard CO2 and hydrogen is quite big. If it's implemented, the political and industrial is bigger than the oil and gas. Industry. And nowadays no we talk a lot about critical metals and critical minerals as well. This is also a big area in mining. And all of this expertise of petroleum engineering is is overlaps. There's a big overlap. So it's it's a it's a good area of specialization, actually. I mean, I found my ecological niche here, um, and it's good. So you can, in terms of research, you can give the engineers a very hard time to compete with you, I believe. Um, but of course, they are always better when it comes to building apparatus or equipment. Nobody can compete with them. Well, let's say to realize a real product. <laughs>
from the engineers can do it. But 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 to to pushing the state of the art research forward, chemists are very strong, um, and you have deep insight. But generally, yeah, I mean it's it's a good area. It's interesting. One of the new things, which is not directly related to this talk, but I'm got interested into the space science, and that is just another trajectory I will go. So it overlaps with a lot of things. You know? Thank you so much. Uh, Kunal, the floor is now all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stefan, and thank you, Krishna. And Stefan, whenever you're visiting India, do let us know. We'll be happy to host you in India and um, organize similar programs in, in person. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. So, well, this brings us to the close of today's session. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed this broadcast. We invite you to view the edited recordings from the past events in the ACS Science Talks Library. At the end of the session, you will receive a brief survey. Kindly share your feedback with us so that we can continue to improve and serve you better. Uh, my colleagues have already posted the link for the, ch uh, for the survey in the chat as well. So please do take the survey. On behalf of all of us at ACS, thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon for more ACS events. Until then, stay safe and healthy.